I would like you to take your Bible and please turn with me to John's Gospel, chapter 4. What a beautiful day it is out there, isn't it? Praise God. Uh, hope you get to enjoy some of it. We're going to continue this morning. Uh, we're in the f fourth chapter of John's Gospel, and we'll be uh, looking at verses 28 and 29 to begin with. And we've been looking at witnessing for Christ, presenting the gospel to the lost. What is that all about? Jesus and the Samaritan woman. We see Jesus met this woman who had been divorced, married and divorced five times and was living with the sixth man. And we note that in, she was a broken, hurting woman. Sin had taken its toll on her life. She had sinned and failed. People had sinned against her and caused her heart and pain, heart, uh, heartache and pain. And she's searching for God, and God knows the heart. God knew that her heart was searching, and he sent Jesus through Samaria on his way to Galilee to sit by a well and have a conversation with this woman and to, pres and to present the saving truth that he was the Messiah to this woman's heart. Witnessing is something that should be natural, and it should be something that is just part of our normal daily lives that we should be willing and available to just share the gospel with whoever we come in contact with, not in an obnoxious way, not trying to shove it down their throat, but in a way where we are willing and available and sensitive to the Holy Spirit that as he brings opportunities into our path and God's spirit prompts us that we are willing to open our mouths and speak and present the gospel. And the awesome thing is that this woman came to faith in Jesus Christ. Let's put a principle up on the board first of all, just for quick, quick review. R.B. Theme has said, witnessing is the declaration of the good news of salvation. The gospel of Jesus Christ to the unbelieving world but is this the responsibility and privilege reserved solely for the pastor, missionary, or evangelist? Definitely not. Every believer is responsible for presenting the gospel to a lost and dying world. Every one of us is called by God to tell others about Jesus. Not to be an evangelist, maybe, not to be a pastor, not to be a missionary, but wherever God has placed you, God will bring people across your path and give you opportunities to present the gospel, and we have to be willing to what? Open our mouth and give them the correct information. And the rest is between God and them. It's between their heart and what? God, the Holy Spirit. Uh, the woman, if you look at verse number 28 and 29, she came to faith in Jesus. Jesus said, you know, if you knew who you were talking to, you would have asked, and he would have given you a drink. That would have been what? A well in you of everlasting life. And drink here is a metaphor for salvation, or for faith, actually. Drink is a metaphor for faith. And basically, he was saying, you know, if you believe in me, you'll have eternal life. And she said, no, give me this drink. And it's only one drink. Give me this drink that I'll never thirst again. She knew that if you took this drink, you'd never thirst again. Salvation isn't believe and keep believing. It's believe right now, this minute. It's not a process. It's an event. There's a moment in time where in your heart, you realize you're a sinner and that Jesus is the Savior and you put your faith in him as your Savior and at that moment you're saved and born again and you receive eternal life. God declares you righteous and forgives you of all your sins. He sealed you by the Holy Spirit and you're heaven bound and you've received a permanent relationship with God and a permanent gift. And this is the matchless, amazing grace of God. And for this woman, it happened as she was talking to Jesus by the well. Look at verse 28. It says, The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come see a man, which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Now she asks a rhetorical question which reflects 
that she has faith in her heart. There's only one answer. Is not this the Christ? Of course he is. That's the answer. And she has come to believe. She was saved. And if you notice, during that conversation, did Jesus bring up this woman's sins? Did Jesus ever bring up this woman's sins? Nope. Even when he said, go get your husband, and she said, I don't have a husband. He said, yeah, I know. You've, you've had five, and this guy you're living with is, isn't. <laughs> but did he make a big deal of it? Did he condemn her for it? No. He just made her realize, listen, you're hurting. You're broken. You have a spiritual need. And guess what? If you take the drink that I'm offering, it will satisfy that spiritual need. You get in the picture here? And when we're witnessing, we don't make an issue out of people's sins. We make an issue out of who? Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that all the sins of all the world have been put on Christ, and God right now is not imputing the unbelievers' sins against them. Even people who are lost, God is not holding their sins against them. You say, why are they lost? They're lost because they haven't believed and accepted the gift. But right now there's a perfect reconciliation, a perfect pardon available to every single person on planet Earth if they will receive it by what? Faith. Okay? This woman received it by faith. Now, let's put a next principle up on the board. What is the definition of faith or belief? Faith is the inward conviction that a set of facts or propositions are true. I say to you, Gina Raimundo is the governor of Rhode Island. Do you believe that? You either do or you what? Don't. If you believe it, you believe the proposition. That's faith, okay? Biblical faith is inward conviction that biblical facts, propositions are true. In other words, saving faith is not believing that if I flip the switch on, the lights are going to come on, right? If you say flip the switch, uh, electricity will make the lights come on, you have faith, you flip the switch, right? You believe it'll happen. Well, that doesn't save. But, by the same token, that's what faith is. It's believing. It's a conviction that something is what? True, that electricity will provide light. Okay? So you flip the switch. Well, here's the thing. When it comes to being saved, what propositions are we believing? Well, we're believing that Jesus is the Son of God who died for our sins and rose again and promises eternal life to all who believe. We're believing biblical propositions, but they're nonetheless propositions, you know? Uh, go to the next part of this, if you will. Gordon Clark wrote in his book, Faith and Saving Faith. What is saving faith? Faith is belief in propositions. Faith is not surrender. Faith is not submission. Faith is not holding out to the end. Faith is not doing good works. Faith is not feeling sorry or sacrificing. Faith is not loyalty. It's, it's one thing. It's belief in a set of propositions. Okay. Faith is belief in proposition. Faith, no, keep going back. I didn't finish that. Please go back. Faith requires thought and belief. Requires thought. Knowledge and assent. You need information and then you have to assent to the information or accept it, believe it. Believing what Jesus says is the same as believing in Jesus the person. When people say you have to believe in Jesus to be saved, you need heart faith, they're foolish. Because you can't have head faith, you have to have heart faith. No, there's only one kind of faith. Head faith is heart faith. Here's where your heart is. As a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. As he believeth in his heart, so he is. The heart is where the thoughts are. The heart is right here. And there's no such thing in the Bible as a difference between head faith and heart faith. That's a lie from the pit of hell. The only difference the Bible knows, the only distinction the Bible makes is between belief and unbelief. Right here, in our heart, our head, we have received some information. Someone told us Jesus is the Son of God who died for our sins and rose again, and he promises eternal life to all who believe. And we say, I believe it. Where do we do that? Right what? Here, in our head, our heart. And at that moment that we believe that set of propositions, those biblical saving facts, we're born again. We are saved, not we will be saved. We are saved at that moment. He that believeth on me, believes the propositions are true, hath right now, present tense, everlasting life. 
not something they're going to get in the future, not something that they have to do more to receive. In fact, the very moment the faith exists, eternal life is given by God. He that hath the Son hath everlasting life. Keep going, if you will. I think there's one more portion. Believing in Jesus' name is the same as believing in Jesus. To believe in the person of Christ means to believe that the propositions, the facts about Jesus are true. So listen, folks. After today, in this series, you should never have a doubt about what faith is. It's the inward conviction that the propositions, the facts about Christ are true. It's right here in your head, your heart. Everybody with me on this? And that's as simple as faith is. And people say, well, uh, how much faith does it take to be saved? The Bible says a little more faith than nothing at all. The faith of a what? A mustard seed. Jesus said you got a faith of a mustard seed, you can move what? Mountains. You see, it is not the quality of your faith that saves you. It's not the quantity of your faith that saves you. Because the Bible says, for by grace are we saved through faith. Not for faith. Not because you got great faith. Not because of the quality of your faith. It's simply what? The vehicle by which God communicates and delivers to us the gift, eternal life. We're saved through faith. And it's not how much faith we have or the kind of faith we have, because here's the thing. Your faith does not save you. Jesus saves you. It's the object of faith that saves. You take a little mustard seed of wavering faith, but you put it in who? Jesus Christ, that's all it takes. Are you with me today? It's the object of faith that saves. Jesus saves, not my faith. So the moment I believe those biblical propositions about him, that they are true, then I receive eternal life. Listen, feeling sorry for sin doesn't save. Penance doesn't save. Making restitution for the bad you did doesn't save. Uh, repentance of all your sins, which you cannot do to, to be saved. How could you remember them all? Okay? Doesn't save. In fact, the Bible tells us that Judas did all those things. He repented. He was sorry he betrayed Jesus. He gave the money back and made restitution. He threw the money down in the temple. He did everything people said you need to do to be saved except one thing. He never believed that he was the Christ, the Son of God. He called him what? Master. He never called him what? Lord. You see? And Judas was not saved, but he did all the things people think you got to do. Feel sorry, make restitution, you know, grieve, do repentance, and he was lost. Because you're not saved by doing those things. You're saved by simply believing the propositions about Jesus Christ. Okay, wonderful. So this woman is saved and gloriously saved. Someone who probably seemed like the least likeliest candidate for salvation. And yet this broken, hurting woman now receives eternal life. She's born again. She has hope. And the next thing she does is she's got to run and tell somebody about this. When you, when you discover the grace of God and his acceptance and love, it should fill your heart with what? A desire to see others share what you have. What a wonderful thing it is. Look at John chapter 4, verse 30. We're going to read verses 30 to 34, if you will. And then they went out of the city, and they came unto him. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. You know, you've got to, take, you've got to eat something. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. He says, I've got something that... They were saying, take some nourishment. You need to strengthen your body. You need to sustain yourself. How can you keep going, Lord? You haven't eaten in so long. You, you, in fact, they had gone to buy some food. He said, you've got to eat something so we can keep what? Going. And Jesus said, listen, I've got something to eat that nourishes me and sustains me that you don't know what it's about yet. They would in the future, but right now you guys don't know what it's about. Look at verse 33. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Did somebody give him a grinder that we didn't see? Did somebody bring some pizza by? <laughs> where, where did he get something to eat? But he wasn't talking about physical food, right? He was talking about spiritual nourishment that sustains him. 
Look at verse 34. Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish the work. What sustains me, what nourishes me, what motivates me, what strengthens me, what keeps me going is doing the will of my Father and finishing the mission, completing the mission that he sent me to accomplish, which was to seek and to save the lost. Jesus said, I've got meat that nourishes. Meat and food nourish our physical bodies. They sustain us. They give us what? Energy so we can function and work and live and participate in life. But Jesus said his meat, his spiritual nourishment, his sustenance was to do the Father's will and to complete the purpose that God had for his life. And his purpose was to bear witness of the Father, to seek and to save the lost, and then to go to the old rugged cross and to settle the sin issue of man's sin once for all and perfectly forever to the satisfaction of the demands of God's righteousness. Now think about it, folks. Jesus said, something sustains me that is spiritual. It's doing the will of the Father. When we as believers grow spiritually and understand that God has called us to a mission and a purpose, and that mission and purpose is to build the church. Upon this rock, I will build my church to win souls to Christ, to witness to the lost, to preach the gospel so that people can be saved. And then once they're saved, to make what? Disciples out of them so they can grow and honor and glorify God. And we realize that if we really have a desire to obey God and fulfill his will and not, not just playing church, but we're serious, we realize that our motivation, our nourishment, our sustenance spiritually is to do his will. We recognize that, you know what? It can be tough and it can be challenging and it can be hard sometimes to serve the Lord and to participate in church and to use our time and our talent and our treasures to minister to the lost and help those who are believers become disciples and grow and to keep the church going forward. It can be difficult, but by faith we realize we can keep going because we will be nourished by the fact that we're doing the will of God. By faith, God will give us everything we need and he will meet every need as we keep going forward. Listen, why does God always allow more needs? Because he's trying to teach us what? Faith. Why, is there, why are there so many problems when you decide to do God's will? Why is, because Satan is going to oppose it and God allows it because he wants to teach you to trust him and depend on him. We look at the life of Moses. God called Moses and he said, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And then first he said, go to the people of Israel and tell them, hey, I'm going to deliver you. So he goes to the people of Israel, tells them, yeah, I'm going to deliver you. They're happy. Yay, yay, God's going to deliver us. Nothing but an emotional bunch because they they're fickle. They're going to change in a short time when they hear the news that's coming from Pharaoh's palace. Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, let the people go. Pharaoh says, oh, yeah, he ain't let nobody go. In fact, because you're, you guys are so lazy and you've got too much time in your hand, we're going to take the straw away make the bricks on your own now and make sure you still put the same tally up. In other words, do the same amount of work, but we're not going to give you the supplies. And then Moses goes and tells the people, and the people are like, what are you doing? And they start, what, blaming Moses, and they want to kill him, Right? He already lost his wife. She threw the foreskins of the two sons at him and took the two boys and left them. So he had the heartache of a divorce and a separation from his two boys that he loved. The people of Israel turned against him and want to kill him. And Pharaoh says, are you kidding, buddy? Get out of here. The principle is when you serve the Lord, there's always going to be opposition. Things many times get worse before they ever what? Get better. 
and people wonder why why is it so challenging to serve the Lord why is it when you're trying to build the ministry in a church that there's so much why can't it because a nice smooth easy path doesn't teach you a darn thing you doesn't learn anything from that it doesn't teach you to depend on God and to exercise faith and how to handle pressure and testing and adversity so that you can grow it doesn't do it so God builds in to everyone who decides that if you're going to make a decision to serve the Lord, you're going to face some stuff. But what's going to sustain you? What's going to keep you going? Well, some people will quit because they ain't really that concerned. Their volition, they're saved, but they don't care enough about the things of God to keep going through the tough times to see the blessing. They want the blessing, 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 but they don't want to go through the what? the testing that leads to the blessing. The Bible says he'll lead us through water and fire to the large place. God doesn't remove it. He takes you what? Through it. Because going through it is what trains you and grows you up and teaches you to trust him and how to handle tough times and keep believing God and saying, Lord, I know it's difficult, it's hard. I don't have the strength, but I'm trusting you to take me through in your grace. Are you hearing me this morning? Are you hearing me? It trains our faith. Okay. So Jesus said, look, hunger isn't a problem. I don't worry about things like hunger. I've got something that nourishes me. I've got a mission. Wow, he's got a mission. And this determines how serious you are. I'm going to be teaching in a few weeks about, uh, two, three, four weeks from now, about positive volition and negative volition. It's going to open some folks' eyes, and it's going to clarify a whole lot of things about church and church life and people and what goes on in churches. But we'll save that for then. But here's the thing. God is always testing where is our heart and what are we about and do we want what he wants. God gave Jesus the mission, and Jesus said, my meat, that which keeps me going, is completing the mission, doing the will of God. What's keeping you going in life today? Let me ask you that question. What is, what is our meat today? Is it money? Is it business? Is it stuff? Things? Is it career? What keeps you going? What sustains you? Is it entertainment? Is it business? Is it a man? Is it a woman? Is it family or is it God's purpose? Is it God's word and God's mission for us to labor with him and to build the church? And we have to realize if we want what God wants, that means that we have to use our time, our talent and treasure wisely to serve the Lord in what he's calling us to do. And he's calling us to build his church and by winning souls, by witnessing to the lost, seeing them saved, and then taking those who are saved and discipling them in the plan of God. So, what is our mission? To build the church. And it starts with what? Witnessing to the lost. Now, let me ask you a question. Are you... Someone who has a desire to want to participate with God, serve God, is one of the priorities and goals of your life. I know you want a home and you want a family and you got the job and you want a better career, but with all that, what is a priority in your life? Is it, I want to serve God by building the church because that's his purpose. And I'm not talking about a building, I'm talking about the people. And that all starts with, I want to see the lost get saved. Therefore, that means you need to become a witness. You have to be willing to tell people about Jesus. You see, and that's what we're being looking at here. Now, folks, God has given you and I a mission. Preach the gospel. Be witnesses. You are my witnesses. There are people all around you who are unsaved who need to hear the information you have. Do you hear me today? Let's look at this a little bit more. Look at John chapter 4, verse 35. (laughs) 
Say not ye there are yet four months. And four months was about a normal time to wait for a harvest between the time you plant and the time you harvest. is about four months, right? And then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already unto harvest. Jesus said the fields are white already unto harvest. Now, you have to realize that at that time, in the ancient world, many times when it came time to go reap the harvest and to bring in the harvest and to pick the wheat or the fruit or the vegetables, whatever it was you were growing, that oftentimes the workers in the field would wear these long white garments. And then if you looked out at the field where the harvest was, you see all this what? All this white. Right? What, was, what did he mean, white? Well, he was talking about the workers are out there, what? bringing in the harvest. Do you got your garment on today? Do you want to work with the Lord and bring in the harvest? Jesus said, look, the fields are white unto harvest. In other words, it's ready. He meant that right now there was to be success. Right there in Samaria, in the city of Sychar, there was going to be success in preaching the gospel in the place where he was at. He was basically saying, Samaria is white unto harvest. In other words, the people of Samaria, especially this city, they're ready to reap salvation. This field is white unto harvest. Just need some workers to put their garments on. Are you hearing me? Listen, what are you going to do your whole Christian life? Sit on your blessed assurance. Oh, I got saved in 1979. I gave my life to the Lord and he saved me. Praise the Lord. Oh, yeah, what have you done since? Who have you told about Jesus? Now, listen, and listen, it's not about, oh, I'm afraid. No, no, it's not about you. Take yourself out of the picture. It's not how smart you are, how great an IQ you have, how educated you are, how much of the Bible you know. It's are you willing and available? Oh, I don't know all the answers. You don't need to know all the answers. All you need to do is be willing that when God moves your heart and opens the door up and there's somebody there that God has opened the door for you to give the gospel to, that you walk through that door and present it to them. And I think we ought to take this attitude with us everywhere we go. Not a bully, not obnoxious, not butting into people's lives, but we should always be ready to give account. The scripture says in 1 Peter 3.15, always be ready to what? Give an answer to them who ask about your what? Faith. 1 Peter 3.15. Always be ready. In other words, we should have a mentality that wherever we go, we're going to work, we're going to the gym, we're going shopping, we're visiting with family, whatever we're doing that... We are, not that we're going to knock the door down and try to bully ourselves into people's life and shove the gospel down their throat, but we're ready, Lord, if this is the time. And many times it isn't. Many times the door doesn't open. But there are certain places and opportunities where the door is wide open if we're sensitive to the Spirit to be able to present the gospel. Do you got your white garment on? Are you ready to work in the field? This is important. And I want you to know something. And many people say, well, you know, I... I I never led anybody to the Lord. Oh, you never got a harvest? You know what the Lord showed me? You can't get a harvest if you don't sow some seeds. Imagine, imagine, imagine someone saying, imagine someone saying, you know, I got this ground out back. I got it all fenced in nice. It's, it's, it'd make a great garden. But I never grow any tomatoes or peppers, right? Never get any squash, any zucchini, right? Any lettuce. Well, how come? Because you never put any seed in the ground. You can't lead someone to Christ if you never open up your mouth. You can't get a harvest if you don't plant some what? Seeds. But here's the good news. You're not responsible for the results. All we are responsible for is to plant the what? Seeds. Give, but give out the correct information. 
Don't make an issue out of their sins. Don't make an issue out of church. Okay? Tell them that Jesus has died for them and paid their sin debt. And if they will believe in him, he promises to give them eternal life and save them forever. That's the message. And it's by his what? Grace. And the Holy Spirit will take the information and deal with that person's heart. Once you've given out the accurate information, your part is what? Done. You can't save that person. You might have to answer a few questions, sure. But you can't save them. Your job is just to present what? Accurate information. But here's the thing. You can't get a harvest if you don't plant some seeds. So, you know, this idea, well, I never led anybody to the Lord. Yeah, well, you never, you never sowed any seeds. Did you try? Well, I did a couple times, but you know what? They didn't want to hear. So I just gave up for the rest of my life. Listen, more often than not, we're going to see, more often when you throw the seeds out there, people are going to what? Reject them. But that's not your responsibility. Your job is to obey the Lord and just keep sowing seeds. Okay, let's move on here quickly. We've got 15 minutes. Let me move here. I want, you to, I want you to go with me, if you will, and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, if you will, for a moment, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I want to look at verses 14 to 17. 2 Corinthians. Chapter 2. Now, I want to give you a word of caution here. And I want you to understand this. If you decide that you want to participate with the Lord and you want to see souls come to Christ and build the church by witnessing, you're going to go out and sow some seeds and you're making yourself available to the Lord by learning the Word so you can grow and have answers and by presenting the gospel accurately and clearly without making an issue out of people's sins but just presenting Christ to them, you got to realize that that, here's a word of caution, that is not the easiest task in the world because most people don't want to what? Hear what you got to say. Unless their heart is positive towards God and they're searching, because the Bible says if we seek him with our whole heart, we will what? Find him. And Paul said that he put us here that if we groped in the dark, if we felt after him, we would find him because he's not far from any one of us. If someone lands in hell, it's because they didn't want God, not because they didn't hear or nobody told them. If somebody wants to know, God is going to make sure that somebody goes and tells them. Okay, that's why he sent Peter to Cornelius' house to preach the gospel. Okay, but that's another story for another time. But go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and I just want to, Now, this, 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 listen, you want to get involved serving the Lord, I think it's wonderful, but you just got to be prepared for what's involved. It, most Christians don't serve the Lord the way they should because they don't know how to handle the discouragement that comes with trying to serve the Lord. They, 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 they start wallowing in self-pity. They get, they get upset about the opposition that they're facing, you know, uh, they think everything should go easy and smooth. Have you read the Bible about God's servants? Nothing ever goes easy and smooth. It's always one test and problem after another, but that's how we grow. And we realize at a certain point that I can't do it, so I've got to depend on you, Lord. And that's when it becomes easier because we're not trying to do it in our own strength. We're doing it by depending on him to give us the grace and the strength to do it. You see, so look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 14. Look what Paul says, but I want to make this clear to you. One more thing I want to say before we start reading. I, just, I apologize for that, but look, just look, one more thing before we go to the verse. The problem in churches today is too many people are results-oriented. They're watching what's happening in the churches, and in America there's this explosion of mega churches and then the other types of churches are staying small and growing at a slower rate and people are so results oriented and that's why the world has been able to sell the business model of marketing the church preach 20 minute sermons that are fluffy on easy topics get a 12-piece band have a light show have a coffee shop 
have a t-shirt shop, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Put a lot of activities for the kids to be what? Happy, right? Because you know why? That's attractive to unsaved people. Oh, a nice place for the family to go and have a cup of coffee. The message isn't too long and you don't have to really concentrate that much. And it doesn't really challenge me that much. And boy, the music is great. It's like being at a concert, okay? But to do the real work of God, going out, witnessing to people, sharing the gospel, presenting the gospel, 99, not 99, but 95% of the people are going to say no, slam the door in your face, or, you know, or, or shut the conversation down. Very few people are called to go door-to-door. Go -door. I'm not telling you to do that. We're not telling you to go door-to-door, -door, but some people are called to do that. But that's a specific ministry. But most of the time, they're shutting the conversation down. It can be discouraging. And unless you are really committed to do the will of God, and the will of God is this, God says, you're not responsible for the results. Your job is to obey me and present the gospel. Your job is to give the information out. My job is to save those who believe. It's, your not, it's not your job to convince anybody. It's your job simply to proclaim the truth. The rest is between the Holy Spirit of God and that person's heart. The results are in God's hands, and God works in his time and his way. Now, you can always get a crowd by changing that around and adopting a worldly business model. Let's look at verse 14. Let's look what Paul says here. Come on with me this morning now. Let me teach you something. Now, thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ and make it manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Listen, Paul says, we always triumph. Everywhere we go, there's a savor, a sweet savor of the knowledge of Christ. Everywhere we go, now think about it. God has called us to proclaim the gospel to all men. But he's not called us to be responsible for the results. The triumph of the gospel, according to Paul, is not that all men are going to believe it. It's not that most men are going to believe it in women. The triumph is the gospel that brings the sweet savor in every place is this, that Christ was made known. What's the triumph of the gospel? It's not that so many people are going to get saved. Gee, we hope they do, right? We hope many people get saved. But the triumph isn't the result. The triumph, Paul says, is this. We make it manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. In other words, we've honored Jesus Christ by proclaiming what he did on the cross to everybody. And just by doing that, the gospel has triumphed because we've honored what he did. We've presented it to men. The rest is between their heart and who? God. That's why there's no gimmicks, no games, no bullying, no forcing people. Right? The triumph is we made it known. Folks, we can do that. We can do that. Don't be afraid. All we got to do is make it known. God's responsible for the results. Hand out some tracts. Make sure they're good tracts that preach the truth. Speak some words. Hand out some CDs. Evangelize people. Tell them about Jesus. <clears throat> it's not up to you what the results are. Your responsibility is just to what? Proclaim it. To tell it. The triumph, the victory, is not that everyone believes. It's that Christ was proclaimed. That's what Paul's saying. Look at verse 15 and 16. Check this out. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, and them that saved, that are saved, and in them that are what? Perish. Paul says, if people get saved, we're a sweet savor because we told them. If people perish and are lost, we're still a sweet saver because we what? Told them. What's a sweet saver? Do you ever smell something when it's cooking and it's got a, oh, that smells good. Makes you all happy. I know it does me anyway. Got a nice roast in the oven with some potatoes and some vegetable cooking on the stove and a nice pie on the side that just was baked. Mm! I remember those smells when I come home when my mama was alive, you know? She could cook. Yeah. But it makes you feel good, right? 
Paul says when we preach the gospel and people get saved, that's a sweet smell in God's nostrils, right? And when we preach the gospel and people are lost, it's still a what? Sweet smell. Is it because God's happy they're lost? No. It's because God's happy that we told them. We gave them the what? Chance. Do you understand? And it honors who? Christ. Because he did it for them, even though they don't want it. You getting this? So the, the, when you preach the gospel, whether they accept it or reject it, it's still a victory. So many people walk away like this. Oh, I've been out trying to tell people about Jesus. Nobody wants to hear. I'm just going to throw in the towel. Well, that's a person that doesn't understand the Bible. You're making it about you. It's never been about you. It's about him. And as long as you proclaimed him, hold your head high, put your chest out, and walk on. And keep proclaiming it. Keep sowing them seeds because I'll tell you, there will be a harvest someday. Are you with me this morning? Now, verse number 16, it says, To the one we are a savor of death unto death, to the other a savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? Well, we preach the gospel and God, it's a sweet smell to God no matter if they believe or if they what? Reject it. For some, it's life because they get saved, eternal life. Some, it's death because they reject it and they're going to die and face eternal punishment in the lake of fire. And Paul said, who's sufficient? In other words, who could be, who could understand these things? What's going on in men's hearts? We, we know people, but can we look into their hearts and really know everything? No. Who's the only one who can do that? God. Paul said, look, I don't know the heart or the type of soil that I'm talking to when I preach the gospel. It could be a soil or a heart that's what? Ready to take the seed in and make what? A plant and a harvest. Or it could be a hard, stony ground that's going to what? The seed's just going to die there. Okay? Who's sufficient? On, who, knows, who knows about these things? Only what? One person. God. That's why it's not our responsibility what the results are. Our responsibility is to witness and proclaim it. You see? We don't have that kind of sufficiency. We can't tell what's in people's hearts. And listen, don't look at somebody and say, oh, you know what, that person there, you just, they'll never want to hear. I told you, there was a fellow that used to come in the restaurant that my family owned years ago. He was a drug addict, scraggly haired, dirty, smelled, skinny. He'd come in once in a while for a soda and a piece of pizza. And I got to know him, and I can remember the Lord. I was a new Christian at the time. The Lord prompted my heart. Tell them about Jesus, tell them about Jesus. But I was a young believer, and I was a little fearful, and I didn't know what I know today, and I didn't have a good pastor to teach me and challenge me in these things. And, I, and he was, the Lord was telling me, speak to him about Jesus, and I never did. Then one day the young man walked in, clean cut, shaven, smelling good, cologne on, new clothes, smile on his face. He gained some weight. I said, what happened to you? He said, John, I got saved. I've believed in Jesus. You see, his heart was ready. There was a harvest to be reaped, but I was afraid. Didn't have my white garment on. Had my white apron on, but, but I didn't have my white garment on. You never know where the opportunity is going to come, folks, when God's going to put in your heart. Speak. Okay? I could tell you some stories like this, but for the sake of time, I won't go into it. But what I want you to understand is it's not about us. Somebody else what? Somebody else reaped the harvest. I could have reaped that reward and had that joy. Okay, let, let's go on here. Let's tie this together this morning. Let's finish up. I just want to finish this up. I don't want to miss this. Um, let's go quickly. We're going to look at verses 36 to 38. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true. One soweth and another reapeth. Uh, I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed, bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and you uh, entered into their labors. In other words, Jesus is telling them, look, there's a harvest right here in Samaria, but other people have been sowing some seeds here, okay? And now there's going to be a harvest. And he says, listen, if you, if you participate, you may be someone who sows but never sees the harvest. But it was still important because, listen, there are people that you can talk. I've had this happen. I've talked to somebody about the Lord, witnessed to them. 
did it for months, years sometimes. Then I don't see them in five years. And the next time I see them, they're saved. And they tell me about someone else who what? Led them to Christ. I, but they said, I'm so thankful that you got me thinking and that you gave me a Bible and that you talked to me because it started me what? Searching. You see? So I, I didn't reap it, but I sowed. And you know what? Listen, not every time that someone rejects it is it going to be never a harvest. It just may not be ready for the harvest at that what? Time. So you're sowing and another one is what? Going to reap. But the Bible says everybody who participates is going to get an eternal reward. Look, it says, because it says you, it says you gather it what? Wages and fruit unto life eternal. Do you want some fruit when Jesus comes? What's the best way to get it? Go tell somebody about Jesus. Keep sowing. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? There's people all around us that need to hear. Tell them. Don't be afraid. It's not up to you what the results are. Just tell them. So, scatter that seed of the gospel that Jesus died and all who believe in him shall be saved. Okay, let's tie it together. Verse number 39, if you will. And many of the Samaritans of the city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified. He told me all that I ever had. Now listen, let me tell you this. You never know when you witness to someone who you're witnessing to. Sometimes the least likeliest person gets saved and becomes a great evangelist for God. You hear me? You may witness to someone that you, you say, this person's the, the, the least likeliest candidate to ever do anything for God, but they get saved and then they what? Spend the rest of their life on the mission field winning people to Christ or preaching the gospel, evangelizing the lost. You don't know. This woman, five Marriages, five divorces, living with the sixth guy, a train wreck of a life, hurting, broken, wounded, now becomes a what? An evangelist, right? And she's able, she's, she's a witness for Christ. She's telling others, and they're what? Getting saved. Keep reading. R verse 40, so when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believe because of his own word and said unto the woman, Now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Wow, this is awesome. In presenting the gospel, you never know who it is that you're talking to. I want to share one thing with you. There was a great evangelist, as I wrap it up, I'm done here, but I want to share this. The whole city believed because that woman got saved and went and told somebody, right? And she started sowing seeds and they got interested in, in what they heard from her and they went and asked Jesus some questions and they believed. She sowed, others reaped point is there was a great evangelist named Dwight L. Moody back at the turn of the last century. Dwight Lyman Moody. Uh, he, was, he was actually from up here in Massachusetts, Boston. Okay? And he won tens of thousands of people. Tens of thousands of people got saved through his evangelistic ministry in his lifetime. I want to tell you the story. You never know. You could witness to somebody that you think is just got no potential at all, but they get saved, and all of a sudden, God gives them a gift and takes them and uses them to win what? Thousands of souls, hundreds of souls. Start a mission. Do something. You're going to have fruit from that before the Lord. Listen to this. Conversion of Dwight L. Dwight L. Moody, the great evangelist. D.L. Moody, the famous evangelist, when he was 18 years of age, was a boot salesman in his uncle's store in Boston. His Sunday school teacher was a Mr. Kimball. And Mr. Kimball had set in his heart on leading the young man to Christ. Mr. Kimball was a Sunday school teacher, hadn't seen him in a while, got a burden in his heart to go tell him about what? Jesus. He was concerned that he be saved. After praying about the matter, he arranged to visit Moody at the boot store. I was determined to use Kimball's own words to speak to him about Christ and about his soul and started down to Holton's boot store. When I was nearly there, I began to wonder 
whether I ought to go in then during business hours. I thought my call might embarrass the boy and that when I went away, the other clerks would ask who I was and taunt him with my efforts in trying to convert him. See, God put it in his heart to go, go speak to Moody. He was afraid to. He fought through the fear, and he got there, and then the devil said, nah, you can't do that, you're going to embarrass him. But God put it in his heart, no go. And now there's that battle, should I speak, should I not? God's saying, God's prompting you to open your mouth, the devil's telling you, nah, you'll just embarrass him. Uh, they don't care, people will make fun of you, shut your mouth, it's easier that way. You've got to fight through that, folks. Now listen. In the meantime, I had passed the store. He walked by it. And discovering this, I determined to make a dash for it and have it over at once. As he walked by it, I said, nah. Then he was convicted, and he turned around, and he ran. I said, I'll do it fast, just to get it done. God was telling him to do it, so I'm going to run over there. Just tell him to get out of there. Right? But at least he was what? Willing to go and tell him, right? I found him in the back part of the building wrapping up shoes. I went up to him at once and putting my hand on his shoulder, I made what I felt afterwards was a very weak plea for Christ. I don't know what words I used, nor could Mr. Moody tell. I simply told him of Christ's love for him and that Christ would save him. That was all there was. It seemed like the young man was just ready for the light that then broke upon him. And there, in the back of that store in Boston, D.L. Moody believed in Jesus Christ. And then it went on to a life of evangelism, led tens of thousands of souls to Christ. I remember, and, and the man confesses, you know what? I barely got it out of my mouth. I was probably trembling and nervous. And I got in, I got out. What does that tell you? It isn't about us. It's about the message. It's about the gospel. The power is in the gospel. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greeks. It is a revelation of the righteousness of God and the just shall live by faith and receive his righteousness. Folks, I remember one time a fellow that worked for me years ago, my family in the restaurant. His name was Joe. Young fellow, probably 16 years old. I had talked to him a couple times in passing about the Lord. And then one day he came up to me at the coffee pot during the busy time. And he, he, he said, you know, I really, I got some questions to ask you about the Lord. And I've been thinking about what you told me. And I was busy. And I was like, oh, Joe, I got to get this stuff done. And yeah, I got, I had a, I had a, I had a, actually had under the shelf, I used to keep some material. I'm like, yeah, read this. <laughs> right? And I went my way. I think I threw up a quick 10 second prayer, Lord help him. You know, and then I forgot about it. Right? You know, he went home that night. He read that book. He got on his knees and prayed and received Christ and believed on the Lord Jesus. The next day he came in and told me he got saved. But now here's the kicker. He went to Bible school. He's a Baptist preacher of a Baptist church up in Greenfield, Mass. For the last 20-something years. You never know. Now here's the thing. You think that happened because of how smart I was? how much I knew, how powerful and convincing my argument was, I barely gave it out. It, the power isn't us. The power is in the what? The word, the gospel. If you'll just sow it, it's powerful. Just tell people, don't be afraid. Just have the faith to say, God, I know you're putting it in my heart. I love this person. They need to be saved. Tell them, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He loves you. He died for you. He'll save you if you believe in him. Are you with me today? This wraps up our study on the Samaritan woman, and I think it's very appropriate with what's happening in two weeks here, Revival Weekend, an opportunity to hopefully bring people in and bring them to what? Christ. Keep that in prayer, and in the meantime, 
pass out some literature, pray for people, invite people, and tell people about who? Jesus. Because God wants you to participate. Sow some seeds. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, this morning we're so grateful and thankful to have had this opportunity to note and to study these things from your word. And I pray this morning, Lord, that you would indeed challenge our hearts, that we'd not be afraid to be witnesses for Christ. I pray that we would sow the seeds of the gospel, that we'd share this amazing love, this amazing grace, this good news that Jesus cares, that Jesus loves us, that Jesus has died and paid the penalty of our sins, and that you're not holding our sins against us. If we simply believe, we shall be saved. And we pray for anyone this morning, if you're here and you're not saved. The Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Right now, you can tell God you know you're a sinner, but you are believing in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Let's take a moment of silent prayer. Now, Father, this morning, if your Holy Spirit has spoken to anyone's heart and they have believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, my prayer is that you would give them assurance that you've saved them, forgiven them, and I pray you reveal your love to them in a special way and lead them back to study your word, that they might grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll have the deacons come forward to pray for the offering. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for all the blessings that you've given us. We pray, Lord, that make us aware, Lord, of all the needs that are out there. Touch our hearts, Lord, speak to us so that we can do our part, Lord, to spread the word in these countries that are coming to us, Lord, for help. You've called us for this, Lord, and just help us to respond. We ask, Lord, that all those that give, just bless them, Lord, with bounty. Help them to know, Lord, that each and everything that we do, that you care for us. And we ask that in your son Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing unto the Lord.
power or prestige It's about a simple message And whether we believe It's still the cross It's still the blood of Calvary That cleanses get discouraged when you're telling people about Jesus. There are hurting, wounded people everywhere, broken, searching, and you have the truth, the answer. You have that seed of life, the gospel. And uh, it can be the least likeliest time and the least likeliest person and you may be like me with Joe. You may be in a hurry, but just give it out anyway because it doesn't depend on who, you. God takes his word, his truth. That's where the power is. He makes it what? Alive unto salvation to those who believe. What a glorious truth. Amen? I hope, you, I hope you're motivated now because I am. Right? Folks, could we, uh, could we close in prayer? Brother Harvey, would you come and close us? Heavenly Father, we just come before you again in your precious name of Jesus. And we love you, Lord. We thank you for the goodness of your sweet life that you minister to us for who you are in our daily lives, for the opportunity that we've had to know you. And Father, we pray that you will help us to honor you and to serve you, to preach your word, to minister it to those so many souls out there that are so hungry and need to know the precious love 
of Jesus Christ. We love you, Father. Just help us to be bold and strong for your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Folks, have a great day.